All right, so 2.45 on the second day of a conference in a gorgeous location is a, is a rough time slot. And unlike, unlike some of the panels around here, I don't have a sidekick to, to entertain the, the audience. So, but I'll get, I'll get right in, and if we have time left over at the end, that's great, and we can chat over in a somewhat more informal setting. So I'm really delighted to be here. Unlike many of you, I do not work specifically in, in the offshore world, so it's been a very fun so a social science tourism for me, shall we say, uh, to meet uh, the many of you who, who, who are more familiar with this world. So my name is Urška Velikonia. I'm a, I'm a professor. Um, the schedule, as I describes it, I teach at Emory University in Atlanta. I am you know, one month and a few days away from moving to Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., hence the, the affiliation is on the slide in case any, anyone of you wanted to get in touch at some point in, in the future. So I do research on, on SEC enforcement. Um, so as I said, I'm an, I'm an academic. I'm not a practitioner or a journalist. I have no contact with clients, except every now and then I get a random email from a random person who either is a target of an SEC investigation or a disappointed investor in an SEC investigation, and they want me to help some. I don't know how I'm supposed to help, but I get these random emails. Um, I do re speak regularly with regulators in foreign regulators working on the defense side. Um, and most importantly, so unlike most of you as an academic, I have the freedom to devo devote a lot of time to investigating obscure topics such as uh, SEC enforcement specifically. So if there's anything along the, as I continue through the presentation, that you raise your hand and ask a question, please interrupt me. Um, but let me get started. So over the last three years or so, I've collected data on more than 15 years worth of SEC enforcement actions. I've put together a database of, it's now more than 10,000 cases involving more than 20,000 different defendants. Some of my research that I've written, so I've written up this in a variety of papers, some of it has been covered in various journals, including um, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, uh, the FT, Bloomberg, just recently in New York Times. So it's a lot of cases to read, as, as you can imagine. Um, even, it's time consuming. Some of these cases are very colorful, like the one we just heard about, Har Harlequin. Or if you think about you know, some more cases, there's you know, cases involving a broker-dealer that cheated elderly nuns living in the Bronx. How bad can you be, right? That's sort of the, the, the lowest pit in hell is for that guy. Um, there's a Ponzi scheme a, a few years back and I learned as part of this research in California targeting uh, residents of a mobile home community. Seriously, do you bad guys have no heart? Um, and then of course there's the more high profile cases involving say Bear Stearns traders talking smack amongst themselves and saying how you know, smart they are and how everyone else is an idiot. Um, so that sort of keeps one going as you're reading over 10,000 plus cases uh, and putting together this, this data, data set uh, about various characteristics of these cases. And the reason I did and took on this project was because there is very limited sort of publicly available data on U.S. securities enforcement. So the SEC releases annual reports, uh, some of which look something along these lines, and they'll say these are the types of cases we bring in those categories against X number of defendants, and these are the venues in which those cases are, are litigated. But this is the part of the presentation I'm going to talk about today. These statistics are not terribly useful. Um, they have some serious problems which make it difficult to use the SEC stats to say anything meaningful about SEC enforcement. Now there's a couple of private entities, such as you know, those of you who are familiar with sort of on the defense side, Cornerstone has a partial database on SEC enforcement, mostly involving just public companies. Um, NERA Consulting, a few years back, did some reporting on, on SEC enforcement, has stopped in 2012. The Wall Street Journal has put together sort of a partial data set. But as far as I know, I mean, what I have is more or less the most comprehensive one than that I'm aware of. So it, it seems to, based on what's available out there to someone just looking in, the only person, people such as like the, the SEC Director of Enforcement have better insight into what's going on, but other than that, there isn't much useful information out there for people to assess and analyze in, in what ways are our regulators doing a good, a good job and in what ways they might be uh, falling short. The SEC also is very reluctant to speak on its enforcement. I mean, those of you who've dealt with regulators, particularly the reporters, are familiar with this. No one will say anything on record. 
um, not even on background, right? They just won't tell you anything. The only people who are often willing to speak are regulators who have stepped down and are now working for defense firms, and maybe they'll share a little bit. But other than that, it's very difficult to get any sort of information. So in the absence of official communication, this is sort of part of the impetus why I'm trying to do this, what it would, to do what I do is, that those speaking about SEC enforcement, about developments in enforcement, about new statutes being proposed and discussed in Congress, tend to be defense counsel and sort of the occasional former regulator. And then there's a very human tendency to extrapolate on the part of everyone who speaks, in this case defense counsel, from their own experience. In particular, when that experience sort of limited to a narrow subset of cases. The problem is then you're using anecdotes and try to sell them as data, and when anecdotes peddled as data turn out to be not representative of, of the whole, you end up with a real risk that are gonna end up driving policy that's misguided, um, or adopting laws that are unnecessary, like the currently debated Choice Act, Financial Choice Act that's currently being debated in the, in the United States Congress. That includes, among other, several provisions about SEC enforcement that are just like, where is this coming from? Who needs this? Uh, from someone who's sort of familiar with this. But, as I said, so questions about SEC enforcement, at least in part, can be answered with, with data, hence my, my research project. Um, before I get into the nitty gritty, I want to be clear that I, I generally view the SEC and its staff with nothing but, but admiration. They, they think they, they wear the white hats. They're trying to do a lot with relatively, limit, with relatively little, right? This is hard work as investigations like the one we just saw into Harlequin. They consume tremendous amounts of resources. And when you're a government agency, you're working within that budget, right? And that budget is, is capped, and that's a hard cap. There's only so much which you can do with a capped budget. At the same time, an agency like the SEC faces serious pressure from the politicians, from the press, from the public to do more with less. Um, so those are some of the sort of conflicting pulls and pushes that an agency faces, in part resulting in what I'm going to start talking about now. All right. So as I started collecting data on SEC enforcement a few years back, it became clear to me as I'm putting together this big data set that there are some weird choices that the SEC makes in how it collects and reports these figures that are up on the board. Uh, numbers that are supposed to report on the SEC's enforcement performance, right? How well is the SEC doing its job? So for example, it, it double counts some of the cases effectively. It codes some of the cases inconsistently. Um, it counts fines that it knows it can't collect. Or monies ordered in a criminal case are double counted in the SEC enforcement action, even though the SEC knows those monies will be paid in the criminal case and in the criminal case alone. So there's a little bit of sort of fishy accounting, shall we say. But to back a little bit, what the SEC is trying to do with these numbers, right, it's trying to measure how well it's doing its job. So if you take a step back and think about, well, how do you measure performance? What's a good way to measure performance? Like public companies, I don't know, you can look at a stock price, or you could look at an increase in revenues, or you can increase in sales, you can try to look at various metrics. But what we're really trying to get at is, what is that, say, management's, or in the case of an agency, what is the agency's contribution to improving some variable of interest? In the case of the SEC would be, say, compliance with securities laws. And that's actually really hard to measure if you think of it. So for example, some of the examples I've, I've used in sort of to, to, to demonstrate why this is difficult, think about air quality, right? So the EPA measure, measures particulates. And we'll say, you know, from 2007 to 2010, the, particul the air particulates have declined, which means that the air has gotten a lot better. Yay, we're doing a good job. Well, is this really the, the EPA doing a great job? Or is this the fact that, well, there was a financial crisis and people are driving less, therefore there's fewer particulates in the air? But all of those things, if you're trying to use some sort of, any sort of variable, you have to back out other things that are going on at the same time. Similar thing with, with, with OSHA, right? So OSHA reports that over the, the 40 years that OSHA has been in existence, the number of workplace injuries has fallen by three quarters, per, per, adjusted per capita. That's a massive decline, worth celebrating. At the same time, 40% of workplace injuries and deaths are car accidents. 
while car accidents likewise have declined considerably over the 40-year period because driving got safer. That has nothing to do with OSHA. It has to, everything to do with driving, with driving more safely. So it's very difficult to actually use statistics like this to evaluate performance. So if anything, if there's any message that I want to convey today is like, use this stuff less. Okay, so now let me get to the SEC now. So use this stuff less, except that the SEC actually has used this stuff quite a bit. In fact, here's a, a chart showing you SEC enforcement over the last, what is now, 30 years. The blue bars are the number of enforcement actions filed. The red line is the total number of fines and penalties that the SEC has imposed on various defendants. You see the red line jump around quite a bit. The dips often tend to be correlated with Republican administrations. The increases tend to be correlated with Democratic administrations, right? And those tend to be largely associated with are there large corporate fines that are being imposed? Are there large Ponzi schemes and various disgorgement schemes that are going on at that time, they will tend to push up the total number of penalties filed. The blue bars, on the other hand, which is the number of enforcement actions filed, at least according to, this is from, taken from the SEC's annual reports, right? They are sort of solidly increasing over time. The SEC also likes to use these numbers when it reports to Congress every year. In fact, if you go back over the last few years, the SEC's um, commissioners and chair testify in Congress a dozen times a year or more in various committees in both the House and the Senate. Um, and these enforcement statistics are often used to sort of demonstrate here we're doing a very good job. Right? So this is sort of this is important. The SEC reports this on its website. This is also always reported in, in the newspapers at the end of the fiscal year. The problem with these is, as I'll get to now, is that these numbers have some significant issues. Um, so, now let me get to the, the figure. So why do these numbers have significant issues? So they're used to report on the agency's performance. How well is it, in the goals of the agency are protect investors, ensure capital markets efficiency, you know, these sort of dual goals. Is the foursome program is largely defined as we want to deter fraud, why we want to reduce the number of frauds out there with the resources uh, that we have at hand. And we're going to use these statistics, right, the fines and the number of enforcement actions as ways to measure our performance. How well are we as an agency doing in preventing frauds? Okay, so any variable, this is in any sort of statistical study, that you're going to use to measure some quality of interest, if it's going to be useful, has to be valid and reliable. Okay, let me tell you a little bit more about what I mean by validity and, and reliability. So validity is, does this variable, number of enforcement action, does it measure what it's supposed to be measuring, right? Is it measuring how well the SEC is deterring fraud? Um, and the, the, the validity is often an issue when you're reading any sort of statistical study out there. So for example, you might be familiar with work of academics in political science trying to see, are judges biased politically? Right, okay, so how do you figure out is a judge a conservative or a Republican and how conservative and how Republican they are? They're not gonna tell you that, right? There's no disclosure form that a judge files. So how do academic, how do people studying this stuff do it? Well, look at the president who appointed that judge. That president is going to be more or less conservative or liberal, so assign some number to the president and then use that number to assess how political is the judge and then they would do that to do various statistical studies to, to test judge bias. Well, that's sort of a problematic bias. Like, is this really measure? Is the president's level of conservatism or level of liberalism a really a good measure of the judges? There's some issues there, right? So let me now get back to so the issue. What are the issues with the, how the SEC is using this number of enforcement actions um, to, to measure its output? So deterrence in the SEC's approach is going to depend, like the number of enforcement actions, right, is going to depend on a variety of different factors. One obviously is how much resources does the agency have to, to prevent fraud, right, to, to, to prosecute fraud. Another one, of course, is how well is the agency using those resources? And that's something that, for example, Congress really cares about. Like, you know, are you squeezing the last dime of a poor agency or are you wasting money on paper clips or paper napkins or whatever uh, congressmen like to think about? But the other thing that's going to affect the number of enforcement actions filed is sort of the inputs. How many frauds are happening? In the aftermath of financial crisis, 
there's more frauds. In 2009, if you looked at those enforcement stats, there were a lot of Ponzi schemes that were uncovered and prosecuted. That, of course, is going to have an impact on the number of enforcement actions you're going to file. So it's already kind of a noisy proxy for, for, for what we're trying to measure, which is how well is the SEC deterring misconduct. But there's also some, some other issues um, with, with the enforcement number, uh, with the enforcement figures. So I mentioned, so the SEC investigates many different types of misconduct. I mean, some types are more serious, other types of misconduct is, is less serious. Um, it can have an investigation, it can be open, nothing, nothing happens. So if you look at, say, the SEC's enforcement process, right, this is those of you who have worked in the government, it often goes through various different stages. First, the staff will open a matter under inquiry, which is just, we got wind of something. Right? Either there was a news report or maybe there was a whistleblower or something. Let's do first initial investigation. And the staff at the SEC, they have 60 days. 60 days to see, are we going to open an actual investigation or is this thing going to get shut down? This is not a long period of time, but okay, you get 60 days. If there's enough evidence to open an, an investigation, then you go on to open an investigation. Almost half of the cases die at this stage. Right? So you can imagine, so think about it, using resources. This is a very difficult thing. Investigating fraud is hard to do, consumes a lot of resources. Many cases, even if the SEC had the resources, might be able and willing to pursue further. But they might just have to shut them down because given what you have at hand, there's only so much you can do. But about half of them survive and go on to an investigation, which then at some point might mature into a formal investigation. And finally, an enforce enforcement action is filed, which is a public proceeding. Right? A for an enforcement action is initiated by either filing a complaint in court or filing a, what's called an order instituting proceedings in an administrative proceeding. You initiate some sort of formal le 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 legal proceeding, and that's what gets counted as an enforcement action. Now, but enforcement actions also come in many shapes and sizes. Some enforcement actions seek to establish primary liability is, is one way to describe this. So those of you think of, say, Enron, right, or WorldCom fraud, or the, uh, we, we heard yesterday about Sam Wiley and his insider trading, right? The SEC brought an action to establish that Sam Wiley was trading on inside information. or. Um, Back in 2014, we're, we're at an offshore conference. So back in 2014, Credit Suisse AG settled an enforcement action for providing broker-dealer services and investment advisor services to US clients without registering with the SEC, right? Those were clients having accounts offshore and so forth, right? So there's those sort of nice, shady dealings. Credit Suisse did that all without being registered as a broker-dealer. So they end up settling an enforcement action with the SEC for failure to register as a broker-dealer and investment advisor. So those are primary violations, right? The SEC went out and said, you violate securities laws, here's the sanction. Now, oftentimes, the SEC will, after f completing this first enforcement action, bring additional enforcement actions against the same person for the same violation. In these actions number two and number three, the SEC might seek to impose an associational bar. You bad guy can, are, are barred from being registered as a broker dealer. You bad guy can no longer work for an investment advisor. So that's enforcement action number two. And then enforcement action number three might be, oh, you bad guy also happened to be an attorney. Now you're going to be suspended from appearing before the SEC as an attorney. So for example, in 2013, there was a case against a, a, guy, a lawyer, an attorney in Atlanta who misappropriated $5.4 million of his client's funds. The SEC first sued him for securities fraud, action number one, that was in March. In May, the same guy named Robert A. Gist settled another enforcement action for the SEC. Uh, agreeing to uh, uh, an associational bar, and then in August he was also suspended as an attorney. So same as underlying misconduct, three enforcement actions, right? Counted as three, regardless of the size and in the importance. Now, um, the SEC could have brought all three in the same proceeding. It's a little unclear as to why they were chopped up, but this happens fairly frequently. So in addition, one of the things that gets counted in in these sorts of in these statistics are contempt proceedings. Contempt proceedings are, the SEC had ordered to pay you a fine, you didn't pay a fine, now we're suing you, so did you get to pay the fine, right? Or, you're barred from being a broker-dealer, oh, you're still providing broker-dealer services, bring another, another action, right? Those get counted the same as primary enforcement actions. There's also all these other types of cases that get, that get added into, which are um, delinquent filing cases. So delinquent filing cases, let me go back to here, 
delinquent filing cases are, are labeled in red there. They're basically the equivalent of a, like a late library fee at the SEC. So if the SEC has evidence of fraud or misrepresentation, what they will do, and the delinquent filing are actions against public companies, what the SEC will do is they'll actually do a, a securities offering action or an issue or reporting action. Delinquent filing cases are you're a public company, you're supposed to file your quarterly reports and your annual reports, you didn't. Therefore, we're going to revoke your registration of the common equity, and you can no longer be traded on the exchange. Right? So it's a strict liability offense. The vast majority of defendants in these delinquent filing cases are no longer there. Over 80% of these cases are default uh, judgments or default orders by the SEC. So yes, it consumes SEC resources, but this is a very different case than, say, an enforcement action against Sam Wiley. It, it gets counted the same when you use enforcement action as a measure of enforcement. Now, if the number of these cases remained the same over time, you would just have a little bit of a, like a cushion, a little bit of noise in the system, but the total number would still get, tell you something useful, perhaps. The thing is that the number of delinquent filing cases has increased since 2005. It went from, say, 10 a year to over 100 of these cases per year. Now, it's good that the SEC is doing these cases because dead firms are very good for market manipulators, very, various sorts of schemers. You can push the stock price up very quickly, very easily, and very cheaply when the firm, when no one's watching at the firm. But at the same time, you know, so the SEC should be doing these cases, but again, these are not the same as the enforcement action against Credit Suisse or Goldman Sachs or Sam Wiley, for that matter. Um, just a sec. And the, but the, so the thing is, once you take out these other cases, non-primary cases, follow-on case, second and third cases, delinquent filing cases, contempt cases, the sort of overall number of enforcement actions to the ex primary enforcement actions to the ex extent you even accept that as a useful way to measure output has remained the same since 2000. Well, let, let me back it up. Remained the same between 2000 and 2014. This is the most recent figures, adding in 2015 and 2016. And what you see is 2015 and 2016, the black bar has gone up, in part because Mary Jo White has, in fact, been quite aggressive about bringing enforcement actions. Now, some of these are like various sweeps, various self-reported violations. Um, if you actually look at behind sort of the curtain, what are these cases like? There are, in fact, fewer fraud cases than there were before Mary Jo White. But it, the basic story is consistent. Uh, with what uh, both Mary Jo White and her head of enforcement were trying to sort of push. We're, we're very hard on enforcement. We're trying to cramp down on crime. Um, and in fact, they, they end up doing so. Okay, so th these numbers are a little iffy. It's not a problem per se. I mean, as I said, enforcement depends on the number of frauds that are happening, the, the resources devoted to enforcement. Um, the only reason these figures are suspect because the SEC itself brags about increasing enforcement year after year and relies so heavily on stats uh, communicating externally as well as, well as communicating internally. Right? Loren, I've talked to SEC staffers who have complained to me about the, the sort of the significance of stats and how it drives them crazy that these stats are there and, and r somehow relevant when they really shouldn't be. Okay, so I mentioned there's two characteristics you want any sort of proxy, any sort of tape measure you're using to measure a quality of interest to have. One is validity. Are you measuring what you're trying to measure? The second one is reliability. So a reliable measure is one that's consistent, right? You also want your thermometer to always give you the right temperature, not to sort of vary widely, right? Or your scale if you're trying to go, you know, way after a nice, uh, a nice dinner and you're like, oh my God, you know, I just lost five pounds. And of course, it turns out, no, you didn't. Your scale's wrong. So you want a measure that is consistent, that produces similar results under consistent conditions. And here again, this sort of using the number of enforcement action suffers from a reliability problem. So let me illustrate how. So the SEC, an enforcement action is a legal proceeding, right? It's a lawsuit. That lawsuit can name multiple defendants in one lawsuit, or the agency can slice and dice the lawsuit against multiple defendants in the same investigation into multiple proceedings. 
Here you have an example, this is the same case, but the SEC filed three different enforcement actions. Uh, whereas in the previous case, they filed only one enforcement, actions, uh, enforcement action against four defendants. So sometimes there's good reasons why the actions are sliced and diced. For example, sometimes some of the defendants settle, but others don't. So in that case, the settling defendants are going to be, there's going to be a separate lawsuit against the settling defendants and a, a different lawsuit against the defendants that are contesting their charges. Makes sense. Sometimes there's no good reason why these cases are sliced and diced. So in this case, for example, all of these guys settled. This could, be, this could be merged in a single enforcement action. There's no particular reason why these settlements are sliced and diced. Perhaps the reason is, you know, you could come up with a nefarious reason like, oh, the SEC wants to juice its enforcement numbers. Maybe. Or there's a completely neutral explanation, which is it's easier to track. Right? This is just more administrable. This is why the cases are sliced and diced. Perfect sense. Except we're using the number of enforcement actions as a stat to measure performance. That makes absolutely zero sense. There are a couple other issues there. The, the coding of cases, do I have a slide there? I don't, sorry. The cases are somewhat coded inconsistently. So I have a slide at some point, I think I have it here at the end, I'll go, ba I'll, I'll go back and forth a little bit. Um, okay, this is the long way to get to the slide I wanna show you. They categorize cases by type. Are, is broker dealer, foreign corrupt practices, insider trading, you name it. Um, and this is very useful to have an idea of what types of cases the SEC is bringing. You can sort of track things over time. Um, but the challenge is that every now and then some of these cases are mischaracterized. There, for example, a case that's really a delinquent filing case is categorized perhaps as something else, or an insider trading case is categorized as a broker dealer case. There's some errors that there that are built into the system. And you'd expect errors in any sort of system of recording, right? Even like, let's say, you know, sometimes when you're doing financial statements, sometimes you overstate, sometimes you understate, errors are supposed to be random. Or at least, if it's a true error, they will be randomly distributed. Now, surprise, surprise, if you looked at risk, company restatements, for example, which if they were truly all non-fraudulent, the restatements would be half would be positive, half would be negative. Turns out 80% of restatements are reflect that the company overstated its financial performance, suggesting that there's some bias there that isn't just pure error, pure chance. Similar in SEC reporting. Um, in a bunch of different years, the delinquent filing cases, the ones that I described earlier as late library fees, were categorized as accounting fraud or securities offering cases. Even sort of more suspicious, shall we say, I have no evidence to, 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 to support anything along like that there was any, any ill motive, but back in 2014, Mary Jo White had just taken over in April 2013. Um, in the fall of 2014, both she and the then Director of Enforcement go on record saying, we've done a great job bringing more accounting fraud cases. Look, we've, we report an increase of 25% of cases except the entire increase is due to miscategorizing cases. Once you back out the cases that are not really accounting fraud cases, the number has stayed flat, which of course is nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, it takes a couple of years to build an investigation to the point you can bring an enforcement action. It's just kind of bizarre to you know, come up with numbers out of thin air and say, there, we're doing amazing things, instead of pointing out, no, actually, it takes two years to build a case, so expect results in 2015 and 2016. Um, finally, I mentioned, I, mentioned, I mentioned money damages and how there's some issues with money damages. The forgiven remedies are included towards the total tally in Ponzi scheme years. Uh, let me go back to the Ponzi scheme years. 2009 and 2010 were big Ponzi scheme years as a big jump. So the dip is 2008, and then there's a big jump in 2009, 2010. Those are Ponzi scheme cases. The collection rates on those that were, well, you can guess, uh, not terribly high. Um, so again, using the top line figure and fines and disgorgements order is not that useful, right? Without, at least without a little asterisk at the bottom and saying, actually, um, these are different, this is not a very useful measure. Okay, so why is this, you know, why should we get upset about this why is, or, or not? It, why is this bad? So let me suggest a couple reasons why one might care about this. Um, one is just sort of Congress requires agencies to report all sorts of stuff. If agencies are devoting resources to putting together this stuff, you might as well do it accurately in a way that's meaningful and useful to the public, to the reporters, to, um, to, to Congress even, right? 
Um, second is, you know, if we have government reporting, treat to t to, people try to, to use that to read tea leaves into sort of how to comply, why to comply, um, what should we do? What should we do going forward? I try to, pr pr you know, um, figure out how to behave. There's also some of it, as I said, some meaningless trend analysis, right? So you might say trend analysis, um, trying to figure out what where enforcement is going, is meaningless. We just shouldn't try to do it. Don't try to predict what an agency is going to do. That doesn't stop people from doing it. Secondly, the con Congress, the Results Act, and the Congress wants the agencies to do trend analysis for some bizarre reason, but okay, they want them to do it. So trend analysis, okay, we're gonna do it. Um, so here's um, an example of, of trend analysis and how reporting the way the SEC does can be misleading. Um, so this is for in, to, in early 2009, sort of at the depth of a financial crisis, uh, the then director, Deputy Director of Enforcement testified in Congress saying the SEC is doing more to deter insider trading. The SEC had filed over 300 cases against more than six Six, 600 defendants. So the blue line tells you the reported cases, um, and the orange line, of course, tracks cases once you back out the follow-on actions, the second cases brought against the same guy who traded on inside information, and now also suspending him from appearing before the commission as an attorney, for example. So you can see that, you know, yes, there was an uptick from 07 to 09, but it's not big compared to some earlier years. Here's, a similar, here's the same chart if you look at just the, the number of defendants targeted. Indiv so insider trading, these are large, largely cases against individuals. So you see a lot number of individuals actually declined uh, between 2007 and 2008. Um, after Madoff, likewise, the SEC said in, immediately in 2009, 2010, we're doing tons more. We're doing more to investigate broker dealings, investment advisors. Once you look at those cases, it turns out that the vast majority of these uh, actions then were, again, the follow-on cases, not the primary enforcement actions stopping various illicit practices, stopping Ponzi schemes. Now, it doesn't always work one way. If you look at the other categories of what the SEC does, such as market manipulation, if you back out the follow-on cases, the second and third actions, SEC enforcement actually increased against market manipulation. So this is, in the way it's reported, it just up obscures what's actually uh, going, going on. So there's some bigger concerns that you, one might have about the reporting and how these numbers are used. You can identify things as problems that aren't really problems, or you can identify, you can miss problems because you're, you're not working with the sorts of numbers that, that, that have any meaning. Uh, let me give you a couple of uh, possible examples. Um, so for example, those of you who work in the United States are probably familiar with the claim that after Dodd-Frank, the SEC is litigating a lot more cases before administrative law judges who are SEC employees than litigating in court. So the SEC, when it sues a defendant, when it targets a securities violator, in, the, in a majority of cases, it can choose where to file this case. They can file the case in, in an administrative proceeding, or they can file a case in court. There's some cases that can only be filed in one venue. For example, the follow-on actions, actions seeking to bar someone from uh, the industry, uh, to suspend an attorney from appearing before the commission, those are always filed in administrative proceedings. The link when filing cases, right, the late library fees are always filed in administrative proceedings. There's also some cases that are always filed in court. Any case involving a receiver, right, Ponzi schemes are virtually all filed in court. Um, but there, for a bunch of cases, the SEC can choose where it's going to bring an enforcement action. So this slide is actually taken exactly, directly from the Wall Street Journal. Back this is October 2014, the Wall Street Journal came out and saying, look, the SEC is bringing many more cases in administrative proceedings. And there, we, we have evidence the SEC wins a lot more often when it litigates cases in administrative proceedings. Okay, so that was front page story in the Wall Street Journal. It generated a lot of sort of upset in the, in the sort of the defense bar on the security side. Uh, Congress has proposed not one, but two different bills. The Choice Act, the one that's currently being debated in Congress, includes provisions to deal with this problem. Well, the thing is, as I just told you, there's some cases that are filed always in APs. There are some cases that are filed always in court. Perhaps follow-on cases are meaningfully different from primary cases seeking to establish uh, liability. Why? Well, in follow-on cases, right, uh, the only time when the SEC is going to bring an action seeking to bar you from the industry or suspend you from appearing at the SEC as an attorney is when you've already been convicted 
of securities fraud? Or when the SEC already sanctioned you for securities fraud? The, in these cases, defendants should and will lose. In fact, the only situation in which a defendant wins a follow-on case is when the SEC can't locate the defendant. They can't serve him with the, the order instituting proceedings. Whenever the, the SEC can find you, that defendant is going to lose, as he should. But if you're including those defendants in these tallies, you're going to come up with results that are you know, biased, in a way. So if you're actually trying to say, OK, what is the success rate? How is the SEC targeting defendants? You need to back out the settlement and look at the contested cases in these primary enforcement actions where the SEC is seeking to establish liability for the first time. So here's a slide showing you. This is, oh, sorry, what have I done? OK. So you're seeing this as the left-hand left bars. The blue is going up, is already above 50% and is going up to above 80%. This is showing you percentage of cases filed in administrative proceedings. Well, if you only looked at primary cases and if you only look at um, cases that are contested, not settled, a tiny minority is filed in administrative proceedings. The vast majority are still filed, litigated in court. And if you were to look at success rates, right, this is again, this is the bar on, the, on your right, showing, oh, look, the SEC wins, oh, you know, 90% of cases filed in administrative proceedings, but only 65% of cases filed in court. Well, once you actually look at the sorts of cases you should be comparing, here's a table from another paper I did, the SEC's win rate, overall win rate, is basically identical in both venues. So it matters that you're coding things correctly because it's going to spill into all of the other things you're trying to analyze about agency performance. Um, so, that, so that would be one example. You might also have problems that, that you miss because you're not, um, you don't have the right sort of information, right? Law, enfor law without enforcement is going to be ineffective. Uh, you want to know is if, what, what in fact is going on. You're also gonna have problem with it. When you look at the wrong cases, it's going to change your denominator. For example, the SEC often gets attacked for settling too many cases, right? You'll read here and there if you follow this sort of press like I do, over 90% of cases are settled and they're settled for pennies on the dollar. The SEC goes too easy on the defendants. Well, 90% of cases is, these are the follow-on cases, right? If you include the follow-on cases where the defendant is going to lose and if they're represented by counsel, counsel will tell them, you are going to lose this, you should settle. Um, if you include those cases, of course you're going to produce settlement statistics that are going to be inflated. If you only look at the primary cases, right, that Sam Wiley cases or Credit Suisse cases for failure to register as a broker-dealer, the settlement rate is about 40%. Okay? So that actually casts a whole SEC enforcement into a slightly different light, right? So perhaps they're not going too easy, at least on a fair percentage of the defendants. And they are, in fact, litigating a lot more cases than one would generally think. Finally, the reporting itself, the way you report, it, might change enforcement priorities, right? To the extent that staff are being encouraged to bring more enforcement actions and staff only have so much time on their hands, that may change what sorts of actions you bring. I mean, this is not limited to federal agencies. I mean, those of you, again, living in the United States are all well familiar with Wells Fargo, where management tells you you have to open an X number of cases and it's physically impossible, you're going to do something. So Wells Fargo ended up cheating. Um, SEC staff might end up bringing cases that are easier to bring. You might bring an insider trading action or delinquent filing action in lieu of a much more complicated case like the Harlequin properties, for example. Right? So, being focused on stats like this will at some point, at least on the margin, change enforcement priorities. And this is no matter how well-meaning staff might be or how, so long as you have a limited budget and limited number of people, focusing on the stat is going to change how you do enforcement. Um, but at the same time, having some numbers is useful. So for example, one thing that this uh, has told me is, so this is a bar showing you the number of enforcement actions filed by month. Uh, and you see the red ones are September's. So September is the end of the SEC's fiscal year. Towards the end of the, the, the fiscal year, 
the agency concerned about their numbers is going to try to boost those numbers at the end of the fiscal year. So this is again sort of consistent with the Mary Jo White story. When she came in in 2013, she really wanted to show she was very hard on enforcement. She's coming in with a you know a, 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 an iron fist and she's going to cramp down on everyone. So in September 2013, so 2013 is the second to last one. You see there's a large uptick in September 2013. Those were follow-on cases against criminals who were already sitting in jail, and now the SEC was going to bar them from working as a broker-dealer. Kind of hard to do from jail, but okay, it counts as a stat. Similar reaction in 2014 when you have, again, a huge uptick uh, in September. Many of those actually are September 30th, the very last day of the fiscal year, again, trying to juice the numbers. I would much rather see that the SEC didn't do this. Um, but some of these numbers, as I said, are useful to have. So since the, since the election, the SEC enforcement has been sort of on a sad decline. Uh, in part because apparently the, the current administration doesn't really want to do enforcement much. That's sad. I really wish we weren't seeing a decline in enforcement, but that seems to be the situation right now. So some of this, what I'm telling you right now, some of this is news, um, but not all, which leaves one wondering uh, why, why the SEC would continue to use these sorts of figures, the figures that are clearly problematic. One reason is probably path dependence. We've already done it in this way, so, you know, let's just stay consistent. The second is certainly pressure from Congress. Like, the, the SEC, whenever there's any sort of scandal, the chair gets called to Congress to testify. Whenever there's any sort of non-scandal, the SEC gets called to Congress to testify. Whenever the SEC wants more, more money for enforcement, they have to go to Congress to testify. So there's a lot of this in, repeat intense pressure on an agency to perform, to show it's doing more with less and, you know, bring, bringing more forces to justice. Um, so the SEC then uses this sort of figures to, to, to show to Congress we're doing something. Yes, Lloyd Blankfein, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, is still not in jail, as you, the public and the press want, but we're doing a lot because we're bringing a lot of enforcement action, right? And as I said, a lot of this pressure on an agency is completely unrealistic and unfair. That doesn't mean it isn't a real pressure that an agency feels like it has to respond to. It's also useful to have numbers that are a little soft. Right, so when the numbers look good, the chair can go to Congress and testify, look, we brought, you know, 60% more enforcement actions than last year, we're doing great. And when the numbers look bad, you can say, well, you know, they're a little flawed, they're not a really good measure. So it is useful if you're leading an agency that's subject to such intense pressure to have slightly squishy numbers. Again, this is not the first time anyone's using soft numbers. That our current president loves to use numbers in, in all sorts of ways. When they're good, he brags about them. When they're bad, describes all the flaws that the numbers have. Now, to the SEC's credit, this per paper that I wrote was first circulated in the fall of 2015. This is the SEC's report released a couple months later. In this report, they break out follow-on cases and report them separately. And they didn't say they did it because of my paper, um, but to their credit, they did do it, which is, which is very nice, which is something that, for example, in private practice, you would rarely see your client respond this quickly uh, to pressure. All right, so let me wrap up and, and leave some, uh, a little bit of time uh, for questions. So what I'm, I think that the takeaway here is the SEC is trying really hard, but it's facing too much scrutiny from Congress. At the same time, it really would be useful to have evidence, more detailed information about enforcement policy, whether it's working, how it's working. Certainly, before we start passing the Choice Act to fix any sorts of perceived problems that there are about SEC enforcement policy, about SEC enforcement. All right, so here's my contact information, but I'll, leave, I'll open the floor for any questions you might have. So what I would probably do as an agency, how do you report is, so there's two ways to go, right? One way to go is here's our performance statistics and this is all they do. Sort of play it down rather than say brag about the most. So just shade it a little bit differently. Another way to do it is to provide a lot more information. So for example, if you look at some of the 
studies done, say near the one when near economic consulting did it back in 2011, 2012, they reported the data in many different ways. So they would say, okay, here are the actions brought against individuals. These are the sorts of cases brought against firms. They would so categorize them by, they would sort of break down Ponzi schemes. They would give you fines by type of case, by is the target an individual, is the target a firm. Um, so provide, give more information rather than less information. That's one way to do it. A third way, I said it was two ways, but actually there's three ways. A third way to do it is um, the way the banking regulators are doing it to some extent, is to not really report a huge amount, not issue a, you know, an annual report on performance, but you have an online database, so the OCC has it, the FDIC has it, the Fed has it. They have an online database of all enforcement actions, lists this is the defendant, here's the sanction, here's when it was filed, here's when it was, uh, here how it was resolved, here's, here's what the sanction was. And it actually, some of them made it exportable. You can sort of click download and it exports into Excel spreadsheet and then let other people do the, do the analysis. I sort of outsource to some extent. This is, this is not like cheap to do any sort of empirical analysis. Now, the SEC has more information. They could do this sort of, sort of stuff in-house. But if, have no, if they don't have an interest in doing research in-house, you could just provide the data and outsource. To some extent, they already do this where the Division of Economic uh, Risk, DERA, I can't, again, I'm bad with acronyms, but it's called DERA, they have a division of economic analysis. They're already saying, providing information to, on, their, on the SEC's website and saying, hey, financial economists, take this, do research, and tell us if you find something, right? So it would be useful to see the, the enforcement portion of the SEC take a similar approach. If there are no more questions, I'll stick around. It's a, certainly if you don't want to ask questions on record, I'll stick around if you, if you want to chat. If not, I certainly don't want to stand between you and the coffee. Uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure speaking to you.